Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is a profound pleasure to welcome you here today. And I would like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to make time for this lecture. I would also like to acknowledge the constant and steadfast support of our partner institutions, the University of Central Asia and the CXO Global Forum. The topic that Dr. Irene Glendening has offered to share her knowledge on is one that is affecting higher education institutions all across the world. Indeed, the rapid pace of technological advancement and diffusion hints at an increasingly borderless world when it comes to innovation and the need for perhaps a global response to the benefits and challenges that innovation brings. It is why her thoughts and reflections will be so critical for us to listen to. But I do not want to get ahead of myself. It is incumbent upon me to express my deep gratitude to Professor Stephen Lyon, AKU's inaugural Dean for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, who has offered the strongest support in realizing this lecture and event and for his willingness to host us all. Professor Lyon will be introducing our distinguished speaker, but I would first like to introduce him and invite him to share a few thoughts or reflections of his own. For those of you that do not have the privilege of knowing him as well as I do, Stephen Lyon is the inaugural Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Anthropology at Aga Khan University. He has carried out research in rural and urban Pakistan over more than 25 years and is the author of numerous books and articles on kinship, social control, politics, resource management, and belief systems. He has worked closely with development agencies in Pakistan and the United Kingdom to support practitioners in applying the most reliable and effective academic research to enrich and improve the lives of vulnerable peoples. He is also, and this is often a surprise to many, a pioneer in the use of computational methods in the social sciences and is the editor-in-chief of Social Science Computer Review. Professor Lyon. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a wonderful introduction and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I think it's very important that this is a joint talk, that we are, um, we are welcoming Dr. Glenn Dinning to something that is not just arts and sciences and not just uh, information technology services, but a collaborative effort. And those collaborative efforts really are at the heart of why AKU is such a strong global university. Uh, we recognize that in John Donne's words, no man is an island. We should be saying no person is an island, but we are not islands, that we are enriched and benefit from working together, collaborating together. So we have two entities within AKU collaborating. And of course we have a, a very Im impressive and important guest who will be joining this AKU collaborative effort. And I'll introduce her in just a moment, but I would like to make just a few comments on artificial intelligence, which she's going to say something about much more profoundly than I am. But as a sci-fi fan, I know that we would have no science fiction if we didn't have anxiety about technological change. Right? This has been a fairly constant throughout the last few hundred years. We have been nervous about technological change. When the first passenger trains were, uh, were rolled out in the UK, the speeds were capped because they thought that there would be damage done to the human body by going at high speeds. Particularly women were seen to be particularly vulnerable that they might have uh, spontaneous hysterectomies if they did not. I don't know how that works out, but you know, this was kind of the thinking that if you go more than five miles an hour, what happens to the human body? Um, if you look Hello. at our fiction, Fritz Lang's Metropolis is nothing but a, a, a manifested anxiety about technological change that people didn't understand. Uh, the last 30 years, we have had some of the best sci-fi films I've ever seen. Uh, of course, but going back before that, the Terminator films and the Singularity. And that's where I think Dr. Glendinning will be taking us to the future of the, the singularity that will soon decide we're not necessary and wipe us out. At least that's what Terminator would tell us. In the matrix, we become batteries that simply get plugged in and we no longer have a function other than whatever little electricity we can produce in our brain. All of that scares us. And yet, yet somehow all of these technological changes, we now ride in high speed trains that go 300 kilometers an hour and our internal organs are fine. We now um, happily use the internet without particularly worrying about singularities, except for a few mad people in Idaho and West Virginia. But frankly, we're not that worried about those technologies that worried our grandparents. 
This is a new one. We don't understand what's happening and it will bring change. There will be costs to it, but we don't know what it is. So this is, I think, part of what scares us. And I think one of the reasons we're so grateful to have Dr. Glendinning with us is because we are educators. It is our job to help students learn how to develop and articulate their ideas in writing. So if we now have artificial intelligence tools that can write better than our 18 year old first year students, why on earth would our 18 year old first year students waste the time when they can just go to chat GPT and say, oh, oh that pest Steve Lyon wants me to write 2000 words on this topic, please do it for me. ChatGPT does it in a matter of two minutes. I had ChatGPT do uh, something on me. I said, what has Steve Lyon contributed to the anthropology of Pakistan? And I have to say, hand on heart, it did a really good job. Apart from giving me credit for a couple of things that I didn't write, it actually did an excellent job. So it wouldn't have got a first or a very good grade because of those misattributions, but it would have done well. And that means we need to think about how we're going to bring this into our education in a way that students understand. In my view, maybe Dr. Glendening will say something different, but this is a tool to be used, but not a master to be followed. That we really must help our students understand when and where it might be appropriate to do this and when and where this might actually be a barrier to their long-term development. So it is a great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Irene Glendinning. She is the Academic Integrity Lead for Coventry University Group based in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Since 2009, she has led and participated in many successful research projects focused on policies for academic integrity and academic quality, funded by the European Commission, Council of Europe, and Council for Higher Education Accreditation. She is currently leading the working group for the European Network for Academic Integrity on ethical publishing and dissemination, her research interests remain in academic and research integrity, quality assurance, pedagogy, student experience, and addressing corruption in higher education. She serves on several editorial boards and advisory groups focused on academic and research integrity and continues to conduct research currently on projects with funding from Canada and Europe. She has published many journal papers and book chapters on topics relating to academic integrity uh, academic integrity policies and addressing corruption in education. So without further ado, Dr. Glendening, I hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that. That's a very strong uh, introduction. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to, to contribute to your series and I hope you can see my screen now. Okay, give me a shout if there are any problems. Okay, so um, without further ado, because I've got a very short time to present to you, um, I'm going to talk to you about academic integrity and, and how we are responding and maintaining integrity within the new world of artificial intelligence. But Actually, it's not so new. It's been with us for quite some time. So I'm going to start off by des describing the scope of, of what we mean by artificial intelligence tools and looking at the different types of tools, some, some we're very familiar with and some we're less familiar with. And then I'm going to talk about appropriate and inappropriate uses of these tools by students. And, and then I'm going to talk to you about what my institution has been doing, what, what um, research I've been leading within my institution to try and um, make sure that we retain academic integrity within this, in this new regime. And hopefully you'll have lots and lots of questions um, and feedback for me at the end of the, of the talk. So here we go. So let's just talk about the arms race because it feels like an arms race, doesn't it? So when I started working in um, research in this field, we were really concerned about plagiarism, very concerned about plagiarism. Um, right about the, the, the kind of turn of the, of the, of the current century, um, we acquired um, text matching software and, and to try and fight against plagiarism. And then students started to uh, find ways around deceiving the, 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 the um, text matching software. 
And so the text matching software involved as a result of that, and, and so on it goes. Then our next concern was contract cheating and use of SA mills and so on. So we drew up checklists and there was new de detection software created. Uh, so students started to respond to that by blanking the metadata that we were using to, to detect evidence and so on. So that led to changes in regulation and guidance and so on. And now we have a new threat. We have artificial intelligence. So what are we doing at the moment? Well, we're just in the stage of panic, but we, we're moving on rapidly from that. So there's lots of new guidance being, being um, generated. But a lot of the focus is on chat GPT and tools like that. And people think about just chat GPT. So I think it's worth just stepping back a little bit and thinking there are actually Artificial intelligence has been with us for quite a long time, and there are a lot of tools that use artificial intelligence, and these have get, been getting better and better over quite a number of years. So what my, my, my working group, my team decided to do over a year ago, last, last a year in March, is to start to investigate these types of tools. And so what we decided, we would divide them up into four types of tools. And the first type are tools that really are about converting and translating things. Uh, and the second type, types three and four, are about generating things. So let me just take you very quickly through those. So type one, conversion tools, translation tools, things like speech to text, um, Google Translate, all of those kind of tools. And these are very useful tools. They've been with us a very long time and they're getting better and better as time goes on. Type two, Spell checkers. Now, what would we do without spell checkers? Paraphrasing tools, grammar checkers. And this is where my group started to look at misuse of tools, because a lot of the, these new tools, like Quillbot, ChatGPT, and so on, are actually quite good at, at helping with paraphrasing. And they're also good at improving grammar. Um, type three is, is what we've been talking about a lot in, in, the, in the press, what people think about when we talk about AI these days. These are SA box text generators, um, things like ChatGPT, Quillbot, uh, another one, Perplexity.ai. Lots, there are lots of them. There are thousands and thousands of these tools. And these are these took a sudden turn for the for the better or the worse, depending on how you look at it, in in kind of October, November uh, last year. But we mustn't forget, it's not just about text generation. There are artificial intelligence tools that can generate almost any type of artifact that we ask the student to do in the course of their academic work. So programming code, graphics, artworks, solving math problems, creating music, just you know, lots, lots, lots and lots more. And there are lots of tools that can do this and do this quite well. So when we think about artificial intelligence tools, don't just think about that GPT about the full range of tools. I want to just take you through a, just a few slides that just look at each of these, these tools in turn and look at what we mean by appropriate uses and inappropriate uses of these tools. So appropriate uses of type one tools, converting from one medium to another by students with disabilities. So a student who doesn't have um, very good hearing um, can convert from a, um, a, a spoken medium into a written medium, for example, um, and, and so on. And we wouldn't want to take that, that uh, facility away from them. It's actually a very useful tool. It's very useful for the students who are learning another language, for uh, um, supporting their academic writing, also supporting their reading and their comprehension, and so on. And those are really appropriate uses for these tools. We wouldn't want to restrict those. In terms of inappropriate uses, if a student in a UK university wants to write an assignment in their first language rather than writing it in English, then translate it into English and submit it as it is, then they are, they are bypassing the, the, the um, requirement for them to learn and demonstrate their, their skill in English. If that, because that's what their, Greece, their degree says they, the skill that they have. Um, copy paragraphs from another language, translate it into English and submit. So you can see that these, these would be inappropriate uses within a UK context. Students also use translation tools and paraphrasing tools to convert their work into high plagiarism. Um, and, and that is also a misuse. 
because really what they should be doing is, is not to plagiarize in the first place. Um, very simply ask, asking uh, your, uh, your Google Assistant or Alexa to help you to solve your exam question in real time. And students have been doing this uh, when they've been during, particularly during the lockdown and during the online uh, world. So there are lots of inappropriate uses as well as appropriate uses of these tools. It's important that students are aware of what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. So even the type one tools um, that we are quite familiar with can have inappropriate uses. So in terms of type two, spell checkers. Now, you know, we would not want to put in restrictions and we couldn't put restrictions on use of spell checkers. Grammar checkers are also very good for helping us to, to um, make our writing readable. And so if they're used appropriately, we're very happy for students to use those for their assessed work. Also, paraphrases can be useful as well, but people can misuse these tools. So they're particularly good for uh, aiding people with special needs and to help to improve everyone with their, their writing and grammar. But again, they can be used to hide plagiarism and to spin, um, to spin words to make sure that, that the plagiarism is found by the text matching software. So clearly there are uses and misuses of these tools. Essay box. Well, we're coming up with some really innovative uses of, um, of um, essay bots, of, of uh, tools like uh, ChatGPT, and we wouldn't want to stop students. Indeed, we couldn't stop students from using these tools. We want actually to teach students to use these tools in an ethical way, um, because they will inevitably be using these tools when they get out into the workplace. So they can certainly, um, we can set assignments up where the students can can be uh, can use these tools. They can use them to get ideas, perhaps for a literature review, uh, to get material as a starting point. But they can also use these tools to answer exam questions in real time, or add, adding paragraphs of text to their assignment, or for generating the content of a whole assignment with no changes. And these are the, the activities that we that we need to talk to students about and persuade them. It is not appropriate to do this. So in terms of type four, these are tools that generate non-text artifacts. So uh, again, these can give students inspiration to get them started. Um, they can be used if a student has, a, has asked a student to use one of these tools as part of an assignment and perhaps to critique the, the outputs that have come from these tools. Um, but students should always acknowledge or any of these tools that they've been using. And also to keep drafts of, to show what is their own work and what they have uh, used the, uh, the artificial intelligence to help them with. Um, an inappropriate use would be to just hand in the output from one of these tools as, as if it was their own work, either with minor changes or unchanged. So it's important that students are aware of that and that we can communicate with students about that. So let's just think very um, deeply then about why we have to assess students and what we, what assessment is all about. So um, if I had a little bit more time, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. So here are my thoughts. So assessment should be part of learning and development. It should be um, integrated with, with the learning process so that students have, can then apply the, the learning um, to create new things and to learn new skills. Um, it's useful uh, applying those knowledge and skills that have been learned and showing and demonstrating what students have learned and what, what attainment they have, uh, have achieved. It's clearly it's used for evaluating the learning and the understanding and the, and the achievement of, of students. It's very important that it achieves that aim. But it's also used for providing constructive feedback on, on, on what students have got right or what is good and, that, and on how they can improve. It's used for praising, encouraging, and also for rewarding excellent work. And it's used for the student to demonstrate what they have achieved and to show what they have love. So it's, that's a very important part of assessment. And clearly, it contributes to the qualification or the grade of the student. And therefore, it's important that we only assess what students have done themselves and how and, and their learning rather than learning that's been contributed by someone else. It's important that we can define 
the difference between what students have done and um, yeah, and what help they've had in any way. So why do we need to be cautious about students using the outputs from AI tools? First of all, we know, um, and, and we just heard an example before, that these tools are not necessarily very accurate. Um, there are various reasons why they're not very accurate, but sometimes they do invent things. Um, and we, we need to be cautious about the outputs and not accept them on face value, even though they, they might look convincing. Because the reliability of the information uh, generated by these tools is questionable, can be questionable, not all accurate. It's really important that the AIs don't replace the student's own potential for learning, because it's, they're at, at um, university and school and college in order to learn, in, in, in order to gain new skills and gain new knowledge. And the AI outputs mustn't replace the student's own, own learning and development as well. Um, we need to evaluate students' own learning um, and development, and it's the student's own learning that we need to assess so that we can tell whether, whether or not they're where they should be uh, and to see whether they need any more help. If the students misuse these AI tools in the ways that I've described or in other different ways, then this could lead to them gaining qualifications that they don't deserve or they haven't earned. And clearly, if they misuse these tools, then they could face academic allegations of academic breaches and they could be penalised as a result of that. That is also, also very costly for the universities to be able to deal with those and for the students as well in terms of their progression and their, and their ability to graduate. So um, when we have to apply sanctions, we need to think about why we apply sanctions um, as well as what those sanctions are. So we need to apply sanctions to deter students from um, misusing tools like this and doing other things that we see as malpractice and, and misconduct. We need to apply sanctions to um, uh, identify and provide the missing skills and knowledge. So um, a sanction isn't necessarily a negative thing, it can be a positive thing. Because if we see that a student doesn't understand something very well, then we need to provide them with that extra, those extra skills, or extra knowledge. Correcting inappropriate conduct. So our sanctions always include um, training for the student on what they've got wrong, to make sure they don't do it again, to educate them and support them, to make sure they don't have any reason why they need to um, um, make mistakes again of the same kind. Um, but clearly, it's, there's also the standards of the university and the quality of the, of the um, qualifications that the university is responsible for need to be upheld. And therefore, we need to address any um, misuse of, of um, assessment. Also, for maintaining fairness and proportionality in terms of fairness, in terms of uh, grades for, for what students have done themselves and the honest students against the dishonest students, but proportionality in terms of we don't overreact to the students who have, um, have abused their, their, uh, their um, kind of um, you know, their opportunities for cheating. Um, but ensuring that the student grades reflect their genuine learning and their genuine achievement, and that we don't give a qualification that the student um, hasn't earned. And clearly there is an element of punishment and justice in there, but in, in my institution's um, um, strategy, that is the least of our concerns. It's very much more about educating the student, and that's how we like to focus our, um, our sanctions. And, and that this is, in a recent publication that I um, produced with a colleague, which is at the end. Um, so um, in terms of what, what my institution has been doing about this, we identified there was a problem way back in March 22, so over a year ago. And so I established uh, from my steering group, I established a working group with a broad membership consisting of students and members of staff from right across the, and we, it's a big university, um, and across the university group, um, with representatives from all different types of people. And so what we were trying to do is to find out more about artificial intelligence tools. And what we did was we invited various speakers to come, to come and talk to us, and we tried the tools, we, we um, demonstrated the tools to each other. 
we then started a consultation with various colleagues across the university to find out their views. And um, our aim is to generate guidance for staff and students and make changes to regulation. So that's where we started from. But that was over a year ago. And of course, a lot has happened within that last year. As you can imagine, things have changed a lot. So in September, um, I put two new definitions of, of um, academic misconduct within our regulations. So the first one, I've actually modified it slightly because we are going to change it a little bit. Um, so I'll just read this to you. So there are actually 20 items within this list of um, what we mean by um, academic misconduct. There's also a list of research misconduct uh, types as well. I'm just sharing these two with you. Using technological aids and artificial intelligence, including translation software, paraphrasing tools, et cetera, um, to generate um, artifacts without specific authorization and acknowledgement of the use of the tool. So that went in there in September 22, or at the start of our year. So that misuse of that, of, uh, abuse of that would, would constitute academic misconduct. And then um, number 13 here, where an assignment is required to be written in English, writing in a language other than English, then using translation software or assistance from a third party to convert it into English would also be constitute ethical or academic misconduct. So those are just two regulations in September. But little did we know in September what was going to happen. So when we consider what actually the university permits students to use different types of tools, and we're looking at types one, two, three, four. In what context should these tools or some of these features be banned from use by students? What can we do to disrupt or restrict inappropriate student use of these tools? And how can we detect when a student is using? So those are the four things we were looking at when we talked to our colleagues for the focus group. And sorry, I'm missing. So here are a very brief summary of what we've found so far. Well, we clearly, um, as everyone realizes, we know we can't ban these tools. They're everywhere. They're, um, um, and they're useful as well. So instead, we're looking for opportunities where we can use them appropriately and we can use them ethically. But we definitely um, need guidance for both staff and students on how to use these tools in an ethical way and, and what would be inappropriate and what would be appropriate use. There is urgent need for communication with staff and students. And actually, we have some interim guidance that we're putting out to, to all our colleagues um, this week. Um, the types of guidance, we, we, what we see as really scenarios on whether or not students should use these types of tools in this way, much more detailed than I've shared with you today. But what we found is that awareness of, among the staff and the students is mixed. And some people are very scared and some people aren't very confident and some people are very confused. So what we did also discovered is that quite a few other um, teams within the university, the big university, had already started to do some research and development and do some to investigate, particularly things like the artificial intelligence detection tools. Um, but we came across a lot of differences in the viewpoints on, on whether or not we should allow students to use them when. So that's an interesting one that we need to kind of face in the longer term. Um, also, we need to consider students and staff that have special learning needs in any kind of restrictions that we've put in place. But the main thing that's coming out is that we really need to look at assessment design, how we design assessments, and very it's very similar to what we need to do to um, um, to address the, uh, the, the kind of contract cheating use of essay mill, very similar. Um, but also we looked at different possibilities for how we could detect and the, and the kinds of characteristics that, that, that show if those students missed the tool. Um, so in terms of detection, we've already detected quite a lot of cases of misuse of artificial intelligence within our university. And some of those cases have we managed to generate enough evidence to prove those cases. So those, that has taken, takes a lot of time and we'd rather be much more um, careful about the communications that we have with students to advise them what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. 
I have produced a checklist of characteristics. I'm not sure how long some of those features will apply, given the, the, the rate of, um, of improvements in these tools. Um, the AI, the artificial intelligence um, software detection tools, uh, as you're aware, probably there are quite a lot of them out there and quite a lot of them are free. Um, and the AI tools themselves can uh, be used to, to check. The, the results are not totally reliable. Um, and what, we've, what we're telling colleagues is they can be used for deciding whether to, to pursue a case but the outputs from these detection tools are not reliable enough to use as evidence uh, because there are a lot of false positives coming up out of these tools. In terms of my own institution, we have access to Turnitin. We, we refuse to have the AI detection tool um, implemented in our institution, but we now have controlled access to it and we are just about to start an evaluation of the tool and then we'll decide whether or not we want to use it and how. Um, we didn't want unrestricted access to the detector until we had a chance to look at it. Um, what we're saying to staff is if suspicions of misuse of AI arise within the institution, then we should follow the same procedures, very similar procedures as we currently have for contract cheating cases. Um, in, indeed, what we do is we ask the student to come to a viva. We interview the student in, in terms of an extra assessment process whether they understand what they've submitted, to check some details of the process of writing, and to gather evidence that we can then take to an academic conduct case if we find there is a case to answer. So, and that seems to be working. Because it's actually quite difficult to, to detect. So I won't go through all of this, and I'm quite happy to share this PowerPoint with anyone who, who would like a copy. Um, so this is my, my um, checklist at the moment. Um, a lot of things were very, very aware of lack of critical thinking, largely factual content, but that is getting better. Repetition of content, and that particularly comes out if you, if you ask the AI to generate something extremely specific and perhaps very localized because it doesn't have a lot of material on that topic. Um, and that's where assessment design comes in. Inaccuracy is in completely made of facts, uh, are, are quite a common trait. References can be irrelevant, unavailable, old, completely fabricated. Um, some genuine ones, and that's getting better at doing that. Um, but sometimes the, the citations are not, don't actually fit um, what the reference is about. Um, sometimes the content is generic of the point. Again, that's getting better over time. Um, in terms of vocabulary and spelling, um, whether it's US spelling or UK spelling in terms of English, Sentence length is, is, is one of the features that people are saying is, is um, you know, it's kind of common, um, very kind of routine, um, similar sentence length, and no kind of short and long sentences as a, as a normal human person would write. But understanding the student is important. Sometimes we, the grammar is just too good for a, for a student's work. That doesn't mean we don't get students with good grammar, but it, it might be a characteristic if you know the student. Could the student have written this? Is the content to advance for the student? Could it have been translated? Um, and you, one way to check that is to check the language within the references for clues. Um, they, they do tend to fabricate data, um, and these AIs, um, and that can be detected by, uh, or it could be repurposed data. Strange synonyms, um, but again, those are getting better. Um, but all of these things could be a sign of contract cheating. And we know that SA Mills and um, ghost writers make use of these tools rather than human writers these days. So it could be a combination of the two. So I hope that helps, but um, there's quite a lot in there. So in terms of staff guidance, what we're saying to staff is that they should be, for each assignment, it, it may be possible, have general guidance across the university, which is what we're aiming for, but that will be very generic. The course-wide guidance should be very discipline-specific or course-specific, but each assignment should, uh, the module leader, the person responsible for, for, for dealing with that, you know, for managing that module, should make clear to students what types of tools they're allowed to use, what they're allowed to use them for, why they may not use certain tools and why it would be inappropriate. Um, 
how to acknowledge tools and what tools to acknowledge um, and uh, how to demonstrate that their own what is their own work um, and again standard of wording will be provided to help staff do that but in terms of student guidance kind of the opposite if they want to use a tool and they've not been guided by the by the by their tutor by the module leader what they're allowed to use they should really ask permission but then they should acknowledge the tool within their work and they should keep drafts to show how their work was developed what process they use and what is original to them um, and failure to do that might end up um, in, in allegation of misconduct um, and then we need to tell them how to acknowledge in, in, in practice, students should always acknowledge any help they receive. They don't, often don't do that. Um, but obviously, we don't want them to acknowledge the obvious things like the type one and two, where they've used it appropriately. That would be ridiculous. Um, we don't want them to acknowledge that they've used spell checkers and things like that, um, unless there is a, it results in a substantial amount of change to their own work and, and introduction of new stuff. Um, and Acknowledgement should consist of acknowledging description of what the contribution was and a reference. And then this slide covers, I'm not going to go through this, it's just too detailed, but um, there are, there is in APA referencing, there is now um, a, a format for, for citing um, an, an artificial intelligence. So that's what we're kind of advising students to do. I'm going to move on from that very quickly because I'm running out of time. So in terms of module and assessment design, it's also about the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes must be fit for purpose. They must be designed so that they assess the student's understanding and not just the knowledge. That's the first thing. The module assessments should be designed to enhance learning engagement, provide opportunities for the students to demonstrate their understanding and apply their skills and knowledge, and also to show what they're capable of to excel in terms of their, their, their achievements. Um, but all the assessment criteria that um, are related to each assessment could be based on the le intended learning outcomes. If the learning outcomes are good, then the assessment and criteria will be good as well. And this, all this information should be shared with students in advance as part of the briefing about the assessment requirements. And uh, there is a link there to my own institution's um, uh, guidance on assessment design. I'm not sure whether it's an external link, but I've left it on there in case it's possible to um, um, access it outside. And that is the end of my talk. So I hope I haven't overrun by too much. I think that's just about the time I had. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that useful. I'm very happy to take questions. I'm going to stop sharing now and then you can. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Glending. That was amazing. I think we can give a big round of applause from the in-person. We have, we have quite a few questions uh, for you and I'm sure more will come in online and I will also take uh, questions from the room. First of all, I wanna say thank you so much for, for making the time to do this. It was a tour de force for me. Uh, to go, you know, we, Professor Lyon told us about the sci-fi fears and anxieties. And, you know, I, I, when you started speaking, I realized we're actually in it when you talked about Google Translate, that's been around for a long time. It kind of made me realize that actually we've been moving along and this is just a progression uh, towards more AI. So thanks for that. And thanks for all the, the deep guidance and techniques and guidelines on, on all the thought. I know AKU as well, we are working and have a committee also trying to address this and uh, the same as the University of Coventry. So it's really interesting to see. I had one question. Um, when we look back about plagiarism and contract cheating uh, in the UK, it's sort of established now. A lot of the universities have the same guidelines, are aligned, are using the same softwares, I think. Um, and it seems like with AI, a lot of universities are individually trying to tackle solutions. Do you see room for sort of national consensus or international consensus coming up in this area? Or do you think that'll be quite a bit of a challenge to do at this time? I think it's already emerging um, in terms of AI. Um, and, and even within the UK, there are differences between institutions, not necessarily in how we're dealing with the, the cases that are coming up in terms of misconduct, 
I think quite similar approaches are, are, um, are being adopted by different UK universities. But there are differences in the sanctions. And I mean, for example, some students, some institutions immediately throws the students out if they're found to be uh, contract cheating using essay mills. They will just expel them immediately. Whereas my institution will try to re-educate the student. Um, so there are, there are differences there. But I think there is, um, um, uh, it, it would be good if we could all have a, have a very similar approach to these things. And then students would know where they stand. Um, but I don't know whether we'll ever get that. And uh, one other question, um, when it, a lot of the courses that we're doing now, we have the classic course in person, but a lot of things are moving to online learning or blended learning. And a lot of those exams now, instead of being invigilated in a room with someone watching are now being taken sort of online from the laptop at home. And that there's a lot of questions about invigilation there already. Um, how, how do you deal with AI when it comes to someone that can't really be vigilated? If you're using cameras, is that even ethical? Any thoughts along those lines? And then I'll open it uh, to the floor. Yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a very interesting um, uh, chapter that I've just um, 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 reviewed that is in the, the new handbook of academic integrity that's coming out probably in about a year's time. Um, but the, the chapter may be released before then. Um, and it's written by um, a, a lady from Australia. And I'm, sorry, her name just escaped me completely. Um, and I do know it very well. Um, but um, what she was saying was that the kind of quality assurance of um, online and blended should be the same as, as the quality assurance of face-to-face um, -face, um, um, teaching and learning, which is an interesting perspective, and, and that's the kind of position from, from Australia. Um, but in terms of the opportunities for um, misconduct with online learning, they are different, and therefore we need to have slightly different responses to them. Um, and yes, um, cameras and proctoring is, is, is difficult, and certainly our own regulations require the student to keep their their own cameras on, um, and so that the uh, the proctor, the invigilator, can see the student um, all the time uh, while they're doing their work. But it it's not impossible for a student to find ways of of deceiving and perhaps having another device that they're using to get the answers. So it's it's very much a question of how the um, how the assessments are set, how what the exam questions are. Um, are written like because if you ask actual exam questions then the student can look those up and will look those up or will ask for the answers but if you write more applied questions that are based on something the students have to do before or based on a case study then it's not impossible to get help from someone else to do those and to um, get help either from an AI or from a, 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 another person um, but it's harder for the student to do that. So it, it's all about assessment design. It's all about how, how the assessments are written, how the exam questions are written. So you shouldn't be asking purely factual questions of students because they, they can get the answers anywhere. And it's not the knowledge that's important. It's very much more about how the knowledge is used. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot for that, Dr. Glenning. I think we have some questions from the floor. Um, if uh, someone can just prov provide a mic so we can hear clearly online. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Glendening. I thought that was fascinating. And what I really appreciate is you've not gone kind of hyperbolic in any direction. You've not said it's not a problem. You've not scared us all. <laughs> and I'm hearing way too much of those extremes. A recent meeting with um, uh, Sarah Elaine Eaton from Workland School of Education in the University of Calgary. And she kind of raised two points to me that that really got me thinking she said her engineering colleagues weren't bothered by this at all that engineering we're saying fine no no we're quite happy let students do that because we're testing something else their learning yeah. outcomes actually did not test the kinds of things that that you are concerned with that you flagged and certainly the things that i'm really concerned with the second thing she was she's written a blog post on this about really not on the students but on the faculty 
are we abiding by our rules when we check our students? Do we have permission to use these tools? Is this part of the policy? And she's saying we can't simply uh, assume that we have the right to go, um, you know, rummaging for AI detection tool uh, without doing exactly what you're doing. Evaluate those tools, assess those tools, think about what's appropriate, not appropriate. And her concern was as much on us, the faculty, as it was on the students' misuse. I wonder if you might comment on both of those things. Yeah, I, I, I re, I, Sarah is a great friend of mine. I, I know her very well. And I do, she's, she's cr created some really good guidance. Um, and so, and I think those points are, 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 are both very, very valid. So in terms of uh, just allowing, um, um, faculty just allowing students to, to use these tools, my own institution and my, my kind of working group have come to the conclusion that we really need, need to leave it up to the individual, I'm using the term module leaders, but the, you know, it, at, at that level, um, for them to make a decision about whether it's appropriate within their own discipline, whether the students should use this or not. And there are, um, there are times, so for example, I'm, I come from a computer science background, that's that, that was my discipline. And I'm very happy for students to use these tools in an appropriate way. But writing computer code isn't what a, a computer science student, the only skill a computer science need, student needs. They need to be able to design the, 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 um, the programs in the first place. They need to be able to debug that code and they need to be able to maintain that code. And unless they've got those skills, um, they won't be able to check whether the AI has generated some useful code. They won't be able to maintain that code that the, the, um, the AI has generated. So just as, a, as one example, um, so it's important that the students have those basic skills in the first place before they then can uh, effectively um, deploy the, the, the AI generated code. That's the kind of answer to that. But I think it very much has to be at a, a disciplinary level. And I've completely forgotten the second question now. I'm sorry. I didn't really just, it was really about the faculty thinking. misuse, the faculty misuse, the faculty misuse of AI tools. Yeah. And, and I think in terms of our own, the faculties, we should, faculty should be embracing these tools as well. So, for example, to analyze uh, the focus groups that we've just been running with staff and students, we're using a chat GPT like tool to do the analysis of the data and to do the kind of um, uh, uh, bringing together of all that data. So there are very appropriate uses of those tools. Um, and um, so I, you know, I, I think staff, but also staff, are, some of the staff are really quite afraid of these tools. So I think there needs to be an education uh, process for staff as well as students so that staff are aware of what the uses are and what the abuses are of these tools. And then they can both learn to use the tools in an appropriate way themselves to help them with their own work, but also um, guide and help students to use them in an appropriate way as well. So I think there's kind of education jobs there on both students and staff that are, are really quite important. I don't know whether I answered the question, but you know, I, I think that's- No, no, you did, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions from the floor, I just have one more. Well, I think we have another question from the floor as well. So, uh, okay, so going with tool to be used and master not to be followed, I would like to ask a question that is it considered plag uh, plagiarism or academic misconduct to include chat GPT or other language, uh, AI based language model, or utilize it as a research assistant in research papers? Giving that it provides assistance and information during the research process? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the, point, the point about that is that if you if you include AI's AI generated outputs within a research paper, first of all, you need to declare that you've done that and, and declare which bits are, are included. Um, and I know already some people have done that. And some of the um, publishing companies have said that they won't allow that. Certainly they won't allow an AI to be named as an author, but you should at least acknowledge the fact you've done that. 
but also you need to check and take response to the author themselves, who is the actual author of the paper, and um, needs to take responsibility for any of the content that goes in there, whether they wrote it themselves or not, because the AI does not have any responsibility. So therefore, the accuracy of that information should be very carefully checked. Also with things like bias, because we know that the AIs are not necessarily factually correct, and they're not necessarily politically correct either all the time. So um, I, I, I don't see any, any um, reason for not including, uh, for, for kind of banning it, but it needs to be very, very transparent where that's been done. And also the reasons for doing it need to be very clear. Great, I think we have another question or, or two. <laughs> Are you able to hear me? Okay. So with the advent of BART and chat GPT, do, don't you think that the lines between inspiration and plagiarism have blurred to a blip? And do we need a new definition for plagiarism to be exact? That's part one. And just to put it out there, full disclosure, I'm an engineer at core. So I, I basically totally support about having you know engineering stuff done with chat GPT because it really helps a lot. The second part is that instead of just sanctioning the chat GPT and the technologies like this, shouldn't we talking about having it ubiquitously available to everyone, making sure that everyone has access to it so that it becomes like a Google search rather than something to be, you know, sanctioned upon? Two parts of my question, that is. Yeah, very, very, two very good questions. Uh, I, I like the kind of, um, the kind of idea of the inspiration and plagiarism. Um, um, and conflict there. Um, I don't think we need a new definition of plagiarism. I think plagiarism is, 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 is well, mind you, there are lots of different definitions of plagiarism, and, and actually not everyone sees plagiarism in quite the same way, surprisingly, even though we talk about it as if, as if it's one thing. Um, I, I think um, in terms of acknowledging, um, acknowledging the use, um, if you use an AI and if you incorporate something from an AI within your own work, if you use it for inspiration, you should declare what, what you, you've used. And in that case, just in the way that you, if you use a source of, of information, refer to um, a, a kind of published source of information or a, or a diagram or anything, you need to declare where it's from. And therefore, as long as you do that, it's not plagiarism. No? So that's, I don't think there is a conflict there at all. But I don't have all the answers. So. Um, so in terms of your question about access, now that's a very interesting point because at the moment, a lot of these AIs are free. And we know how much money has been invested in, in developing these AIs. And therefore, they're not going to be free for long. And there will be charges and already charges are starting to be um, um, applied to, to some of the tools. And so that that will happen. Um, some of the some of these tools will be just freely available through things like office tools and so on. But some of the tools will be charged, and therefore there is a kind of um, there is an affordability question, isn't there? Where uh, students, some students may be able to afford them, and some students may not. Um, and maybe when that happens, when we when we have this kind of price differentiation. We need to think again about whether or not uh, institutions should buy licenses for the, the tools that are useful to students so that all students should have access to them. Um, but be very clear about when they're allowed to use them and when they're not and under what circumstances. So that there always will be restrictions because we, you know, we simply have to make sure that we are assessing the students' own work, which is the point I've been trying to make in, in the talk, really. And, and not the work of um, a ghostwriter or an AI or whatever, whether it's a person or a, or a, a robot. It's a student's work that we need to be assessing, not necessarily um, all the work that they've handed in. So uh, as, as long as there is acknowledgement and as long as um, um, the student declares and is transparent about how long, what they've used, and the staff as well, you know, we're talking about students, but also as long as everyone's transparent about the use of these tools, that is not plagiarism and the definition of plagiarism doesn't need to be changed, in my opinion. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question because I'm being cognizant of time. Um, so please go right. ahead. Um, hello, uh, so my question is, um, do you think in the very near future, uh, text-based AI will improve so much that it'll be, uh, like it'll be able to perfectly emulate, uh, you know, human output? And if so, if that happens, if uh, it cannot be detected by anti-AI tools, then what would the next step be? Would it be to just completely uh, ban these companies that are you know, offering AI? Or how, how would you go about it? Well, I don't have all the answers for stuff. <laughs> stuff I never did have. But um, a banning anything, you, you can't ban these tools. They're out there and they're with us and we, they're, they're, they're there forever. Um, you can't stop progress. So, you know, stop that one um, do I think they'll ever get to the stage where I think they're pretty close now but there are things that you know that, that the checklist that I produced shows us where the flaws are at the moment but it won't be long before some of those flaws are are covered up so uh, you know they're, they're, they're catered for so it won't I don't think it would be long before they are producing pretty good stuff um, so um, I don't know the answer um, and I'm glad I won't be teaching for much longer um, because <laughs> I won't have the problem if I'm trying to solve that one. So, um, you know, I think that's that's the next dilemma, isn't it? So at the moment we are, we are, um, I think one of the points we, is we, we need to realise that students, most students are honest and most students pay a lot of money for their education. And they know they're throwing that money away by not learning because they might get a qualification they haven't deserved. They might kind of cheat their way through through college and end up with a qualification. But what kind of skills have they got for the workplace then? None, you know. And so they're, they're, the money they spent on their education is wasted and their degree is worthless. So if that happens, um, then it is a student that will lose because they simply won't have the skills for so these are the kind of messages we need to get over to students. And uh, so although I don't have an answer to your question, um, I've answered it in a slightly different way, is that it, it's really in the hands of students to realise where their, where their best interests are and for us to have those conversations with students um, about their learning, um, but also pre to prepare them for the new world where they will be using these tools um, and there's, there'll still be human input needed um, but it's the higher level skills that the student that the students will have to use in their future careers, not the skills of the kind of routine stuff that the AIs can, can help us with. So I hope that answers the question in some way. Dr. Glenning, just one last question, just because it was thought provoking. Um, <laughs> we've talked about how AI, can, you know, the risk of AI to academic integrity, but are there any efforts for using AI to actually enhance academic integrity, uh, including for plagiarism detection or data falsification or image manipulation. So I just, very different yes. angle. And of course, there's some, there's, there's some great uses of AIs in science now, really fantastic uses of AIs. And um, I, I, I was in a, a, a presentation of some colleagues in um, our arts and humanities faculty a couple of weeks back. They were showing how AIs can be used to help with um, with design um, and how they can do kind of routine things like coming up with diff different permutations of kind of wheel design on, on automotive design, things like that. And so there are fantastic um, ethical uses of, of AI tools for, for those kind of things to take some of the drudgery away from, from the kind of design process. And those are the, the um, ethical uses that we should be making of those. Um, in terms of um, academic integrity itself, um, the AI detection tools, uh, as I've said, can be used to, to detect um, AI, um, AI misuse. But at, at, the, at the moment, they're certainly not reliable enough. There's a lot of false positives and some false negatives as well coming out. Um, but, but that will be the future, I think. So we need to look for those ethical uses. We, we need to exploit the tools for good use and, um, yeah, and, and, and learn to live 
with AIs because they're not going to go away. Dr. Glendening, I, I'm just being cognizant of time. Thank you so, so much for such an engaging discussion. I know there's still questions pending, but we're just out of time. I really thank you for taking your time, time out of your day to give us this talk and this very enlightening lecture. I know on behalf of Professor Lyon on the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, we would like to say thank you. And from the office of the CIO, uh, Shokat Ali Khan, who you met and engaged with first, I just wanted to say thanks to you. And thanks to everyone participating in person and online. Thanks for, for the lecture and for participating. And thanks again to Dr. Glenning for volunteering her time uh, for, for all of us here today. Thanks so much.